Number three, we must stop letting tradition outweigh relationships. Let me say that one again because it's not the most popular, but it's one of the most important. We have to stop letting tradition outweigh relationships. Okay, so what does this mean? Basically, it means that we need to forget this phrase. How many have ever heard this phrase? I'm sure we've all heard it in a church, but the phrase is this. This is how we always did it. Nothing kills growth in a church. Nothing turns off the younger generation. And when they come in fired up, excited for God, and they're put in their place and told, this is how we've always did it. We don't need your ways coming in here and making things different. That is a huge killer in our churches. I'm not against tradition. We all come from rich traditions. The tradition of the Pentecostal movement's rich. The traditions of our own churches. Every church has a story. Those are important. They're important to remember. We can never let the past dictate our future and keep the younger generation from coming in. I remember after my mom passed away, she had, um, about five years ago it was, she had a disease, it wasn't a disease, but like a sickness that if she got around any kind of a smell, I mean any kind of a smell, it would close her lungs down and she couldn't breathe. We'd have to rush her to the emergency room. Um, so her life was very limited, and during that time, my sister and I both lived at home with my mom. We took care of her. Um, basically, our lives revolved around taking care of her. We didn't get to go to church. We didn't go anywhere. Um, and then she passed away, went to heaven, and we were able to start going to church again. The reason we could go to church is because my dad was a very abusive man. He was off Sundays. We couldn't leave him alone, but that's a whole other workshop. So, <laughs> um, But when we first started attending this church, we walked in, and... We went, as new people in the church, never been before, went and just sat down. A couple of seconds later, this older gentleman and his wife walked up to us, they tapped me on the shoulder and said, um, excuse me, this is where I always sit. I always sit in this pew, straight over from that window, and you're in my seat. Okay, now like I said before, I don't get offended. I'm very sarcastic. I had a few comments after he left. Um, but, you know, we just kind of got up and we moved seats, gave him his precious seat. But... Say it hadn't been me, if it had been an unsaved person or a new believer had just come to that church. Doesn't that just scream, welcome to our church, welcome to God's family, we love you? I mean, seriously, but he had his seat, it, it was his tradition. That's what I'm talking about. We can't be having that in our churches. Last year, my sister and I were invited to a friend's church for, I think it was um, Christmas Eve or Thanksgiving, I don't remember what it was. One of the holidays, since just the two of us, it was just us, so somebody asked us over. And they also had some friends from their old church they used to go to for dinner. And when these people came in, you know, quickly the conversation turned into one of those, this is what's wrong with our church. We've all heard them, right? We've all been, I hate those conversations. But anyways, and quickly it turned into this one woman just started in on the basic argument that all, well, not all, but a lot of older people have about church. What is it? Worship. And I could feel, as she started talking, I could feel Odessa's, my sister's eyes burning into me saying, shut up, do not say a word, keep your mouth shut. And it took every ounce of strength for me to keep my mouth quiet. I almost lost it when she said these words. She said, you could think they could sing more hymns like us older people like. After all, we're the one who pay the tithes. We should get our money's worth and sing more hymns. I almost fell off my seat, and I could feel Odessa's eyes glaring at me saying, shut up, be quiet. I had so many questions I want to ask her. I want to know, like, how many hymns buy you? How much of a tithe buys you a hymn? Does 10% buy you one hymn? Does 15% buy you two hymns? You know, well, with 20% tithe, can we ban the drums, just get them off the stage? You know, if I tithe 30%, can I keep from having to listen to your grandchild sing during the offertory and spare my ears? You know... If I tie 40%, could we do Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi for the offering? I mean, seriously, how much did you get out of this? And Adessa is just sitting there, shut up, be quiet, be quiet. And I was like, I was good. I kept it to myself until I got in the car, then I told her all of them. But um, I managed to control myself. But the point is, sure, her focus was on her traditions. Shouldn't the proper attitude have been... I'm able to support the church. I'm already saved. I'm going to heaven. Why don't we do what's going to attract the next generation? Why don't we do what's going to bring them in? I'm already in God's kingdom. Let's do what we can do to attract them. Shouldn't that have been the concern, reaching out to others? We need to stop letting our traditions trump relationships. 
We're pushing the younger generation out the door. We're making it all about what we want and it's ignoring what they like, what their desires, what's going to attract them to God. Isaiah 43, 19 says, See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Jesus said in Matthew 15, Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? And I think it's time that we all ask ourselves that same question. Why do we sacrifice fulfilling the Great Commission for the sake of our tradition? Music